Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Economic and Political History Podcast. I'm Javier Mejia, your host from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure of being with Michael Mann, Michael is a distinguished research professor of sociology at UCLA, and he's the author of On Wars, a book that was published a few months ago by Yale University Press. I'm very excited of having Michael here with us. Hi, Michael. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm very glad that you're here, and I would like to start our conversation by asking you about your, your life and your career. I know you are British, that you studied in the UK and that you began your career there. I also know that your work was initially uh, somewhat different from the topics that you have studied in the last 20 or even 30 years. You initiated as a rather micro, if that's probably, I don't know if that's the right word to call that in sociology, but interested in sort of smaller scale type of questions. And I'm curious about that. I'm curious about how you transition your career from, well, that type of scholar to the scholar that you have been in the last few decades that is interested in these big macro questions um, that use history intensively. And also about your arrival to the US. You, When you moved here to California, you had already a well-established career in the UK. How was that process? Or did you end up working on the type of things that, that you do now? Uh, well, uh, it, it could be a long story, but I, I'll make it short. Uh, yes, I was uh, born in Manchester, England, and I went to Oxford University where I majored in history um, as an undergraduate. I didn't know what I was going to do after that. Uh, I thought I might be a social worker, so I did a diploma in social work, and I did some sociology in the course of that. And that uh, uh, persuaded me to do a PhD in sociology. I studied workers in particular situations, such uh, projects, uh, first of all in Oxford and then in Cambridge, where I moved to. Uh, and uh, then I had a I got a teaching position at Essex University, and there I had to teach sociological theory, course on the Enlightenment, various things like that. And I kept a couple of weeks ahead of the students, as the way that a, a new professor does, uh, and I became more interested in general topics, and I began exploring. Uh, at that point, uh, what I saw as four main sources of social power, um, economic, ideological, military, and political, and I separated the military and political, which was not done at that, that uh, point in time by either Weberians or Marxists. Um, so um, I began to write papers on uh, these forms of power, and I started on what was supposed to be an ordinary length book on power in various societies, the Roman Empire, feudalism, contemporary world. Uh, and that grew and, and grew. And of course, eventually it turned into four volumes, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> comprising a history of power in human societies from the very beginning to the end point, at which that point was 2012. Um, and I became well known for that. Uh, however, when the first volume was uh, published, I felt it might um, disappear through the cracks of academia because it wasn't really conventional history and not many sociologists were going back as far in time to do historical work as I was going so I wrote to everyone I knew in America, which consisted of six people, huh? and uh, said, uh, can I come and give a talk? So I did, 
And so I had a lecture to it. By the time that I that came off, uh, I didn't need it anymore because the book uh, was the kind of instant success, unexpectedly. Um, anyway, Americans assumed that if I was doing this, I wanted a job, which wasn't the case, but <laughs> I got uh, offered positions. <laughs> And uh, my wife is a sociologist as well, and a couple of them came up with uh, dual offers for both. One was uh, UCLA in Southern California, and it was I was at the London School of Economics by that point in time, and it was February in London, and which is <laughs> <laughs> I know what that means, of course. And so we said, my wife and I. Well, we'll go for a year. You know, we we deserve a bit of sunshine, and we stayed. And so, <laughs> it, life doesn't get planned out. In my experience, you you make you uh, make decisions, make shifts, and things flow from that. Uh, as well as the four volumes of Social Power, I uh, uh, I've written a book on fascism and one on ethnic cleansing, and a severe critique of American foreign policy in the Middle East, which was published as under the title Incoherent Empire in 2003, I think, in which uh, predicting what would happen in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I, I published it uh, just at the moment when Iraq was being invaded, and I said how neither of these was going to work for very particular reasons. And so um, sociologists uh, don't normally try and predict. <laughs> In this case, I did, and I was largely correct. Um, when I'd finished the four volumes, it occurred to me that though military power was one of the four sources, and I had uh, dealt extensively with military power, I had never really focused on the main form of military, which is killing people. So uh, I decided, uh, I had a couple of papers that I'd never used on uh, the, the trend of war through uh, through history, and uh, I expanded that and worked for about eight years on this uh, on, on this book uh, on wars, which had just been published. Now, any experience of war myself, with one exception, which was that I was actually born in 1942 in the cellar of a maternity hospital in Manchester during the last German bombing raid on Manchester. So I was blissfully unaware of this, of course. Uh, that's my only contact with war because... Uh, National service, military service, was abolished in Britain a year before it would have been my turn to do it. And then came a citizen of the U.S., and um, I was too old for military service. So this is a kind of, um, this is like how anthropologists study societies which are quite unlike their own. And in this case, I was studying uh, people whom I didn't really understand, uh, but desired to uh, try and uh, and understand. And so, uh, but it's what happened, and we can obviously talk about this book at length. <laughs> of course, no, and I want to get to that in, in a second, but I have one more question about your, well, your experience building your career and is this uh um this just a way of dealing with a different economic environment did you 
because you describe as a very smooth transition, you move from the UK to to the US, but was it such a thing? Was did you was it hard to adapt? Was it, do we do a different type of uh, research here? Is the pressure of uh, peers different here? I don't know. I'm curious about that uh, that experience. Um, well, it wasn't uh, all that different. Um, I uh, I think um, uh, politically there was obviously a, a big dif uh, difference, and I had been quite active in in UK politics uh, in in two ways. Uh, Firstly, I was active in the British Labour Party, and secondly, I was active in CND, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, which uh, uh, these were uh, that was a very live issue in when I was in my twenties, and in fact, that was the, the case where really um, there was a juncture between my politics and uh, my work because uh, many of my friends were kind of less leftist Marxists and they believed that war was a product of different modes of production and the like. And I had come to the conclusion that no, the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Cold War, uh, didn't have a great deal to do with class but had a great deal to do with great power domination, uh, and with ideologies of uh, what is a good society. And so that's led me to separate military power from political power, and um, that it was, uh, there was a, a, a separate form of power based on uh, uh, the means of killing. Um, but your question was about difficult, well, no, California, Southern California is uh, well, it's quite distinctive in some ways, but it's, uh, in American terms, it's decidedly liberal. And so that was more in keeping with my own background, though in Britain we wouldn't call it liberal, we'd call it labor. And, and so I didn't have a great deal of difficulty in making transition and uh, my, uh, I have three children. They've all had a mixture of education in the two countries. And one is still in the U.S., the other two are in London. <laughs> so, um, well, it's... Uh, Anglo-Saxon society, as the French like to call it, uh, has some similarities uh, across the Atlantic. And uh, uh, I was in quite a privileged position in the U.S. Uh, and uh, so I e eased into it and it happens that UCLA is a first-rate university with wonderful resources. So things were not difficult. Let me use one element that you just uh, brought in this question to start talking about the book, which is um, your ideas about the origins of a war, right? And and one thing that you are quite clear in the book is that war seems to be a result of the emergence of state and social hierarchies, right? So I would like to ask you about that I would like to ask you about the type of evidence that you bring in to argue that wars were not a thing before these things happened in in human history, and also about the logic of it. Right? It's uh, what does it mean that before the emergence of states and hierarchical structures, humans didn't have the objectives that they chase when they make war or is it that we had other tools to deal with those tensions and reach those objectives how do you think about uh, that issue um 
Well, the question of whether there were wars in prehistoric human societies is uh, still a kind of live issue. There's still people who argue that there were. There were uh, because we're talking about societies that were extremely small. Uh, and I read uh, all the literature that I could read, and I came down on the side of uh, people who said there weren't really wars. Now, um, <laughs> it's obvious in the, <clears throat> in the early literature that there is one place in the world where, that, where there were inter-clan wars uh, before there was anything uh, that you might call late or uh, you know, all much in the way of social classes, uh, and that's uh, Australia. And really the only cases of, uh, you know, of uh, feuding plans uh, from prehistoric uh, in, uh, come, from, uh, uh, come from there and elsewhere, anthropologists have tended to have found that there is nothing quite like wars. There are these famous encounters which anthropologists uh, and colonialists uh, saw um, of a, a lineage clan uh, you know, marching out to confront another arrival clan uh, on, as it were, a, an agreed place. And they would hurl abuse at each other and perhaps a spear or two. Um, and uh, if there was a casualty, that was usually the end of it. And so it was a symbolic demonstration of your solidarity and power. Well, we're talking about societies, of course, with very little in the way of surplus. So um, the, the economic basis for warfare is fairly feeble, really. Um, but of course, there are other reasons why groups might go to war. But it seemed to me um, not only that uh, prehistoric scientists didn't make war, uh, but also the first societies which are counted as civilizations, as pristine civilizations, and that is uh, civilization uh, which developed uh, central places, uh, settlement, uh, uh, monuments, uh, and perhaps literacy, though that tends to come a little bit later, and that uh, in these societies, uh, there isn't war either, or at least there are no archaeological remains in some of the um, very earliest societies. There are no archaeological remains, uh, remains of fortifications. Uh, there's no depictions of, uh, and, and on bases and things of uh, humans fighting each other. And that seems to have come a little bit later in, in time. Well, a little bit later means... Uh, a long time later, but uh, we're talking about very early times now. So that's something that I feel uh, has been established, and that what one can see is that um, economic power relations and also ideological, that is uh, clear evidence of big monumental buildings with an apparently on religious purpose, most often as a, as a meeting point, uh, that these forms of two forms of power developed before the state, that is political power, and, and be, but so I would defend that position. And let me follow up by opening one of the big um, claims of the book, which is that wars are irrational and which is uh for those of us who are economies whenever rationality is uh brought to the table it's uh surprising right so i want to ask you about what do you mean by that it is irrational for whom and under what um from which perspective are you are you framing this as irrational decisions 
Okay, well, wars may be rational in terms of means or ends. In terms of means, uh, the uh, in one the case of war, uh, there would be careful consideration of pluses and minuses and uh, uh, a, a kind of strongly realistic sense of w what the chances of achieving anything through war might be. And uh, you know, we, we don't find all that much of that, but, uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that probably. Um, or they can be rational in terms of ends. That is, uh, that the end uh, which is likely to be achieved is a desirable and and uh, I had some problems with um, both of these, and this distinguishes me sharply from the dominant theory in political science, which is realism. <laughs> um, and there is both a offensive realism and defensive realism, offensive realism is you go to war to make gains, uh, often, well, <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, defensive realism is, is the notion that you have to be on your guard because there is no uh, international law, there are no norms in space between societies, uh, that you always have to be on your guard against attacks from others, and so you have to be prepared to defend yourself. Um, now, um, I devised quite a simple test of those two uh, positions. The first one, offensive war, uh, and do they actually achieve their goals? Well, we have some guidance. Uh, let me say that, that my data are a mixture of relying on the quantitative studies done by political scientists on war since 1816 as a well-known data set, which is all about that, right? But what I've added to that is wars and sequences of wars across uh, all of the well-documented um, uh, civilizations of, of history, uh, so that uh, I look at uh, Chinese, Japanese, uh, pre-Columbian American, Latin America, Rome, uh, thousand years of European history, etc., etc so that I have a large number of, of cases uh, from previous eras, as well as the political sciences wars. Or since 1816, there are four political science studies which um, have versions um, on um, whether wars achieve their results in the specific sense of does the aggressive power win? So this is only a study of wars where there is an aggressive power rather than mutual descent into, descent into a war. Right? Now, the question is, um, do the aggressors win? Well, they do in about 50% of wars. 50% is the average of these four studies in the modern period. And I also looked at sequences of wars in other civilization, for example, in the uh, Song Dynasty in China in the 11th century. Um, and there were uh, six major aggressive wars by the dynasty. They won two and lost four. So uh, you know we can build this this up this model up uh, and find it don't usually win it's only a fifty fifty chance well I mean would you you know come to war cause the deaths of 
thousands and thousands of people with only a 50% chance of, of winning. Moreover, a, a good portion of that 50% where it does pay off are what I call sharks against minnows, that is great powers against small ones, where it's no big deal to be able to see that if, if you manage to isolate the small power and you invade, you, you'll have it a good chance of winning. So the the, the odds in, uh, in in other cases are, are even uh, lower. So and that's um, offensive war, right? Mm. As far as defensive war, and it's supposed to be the, the principal means of protecting your independence. But the striking thing about the, the course of history is how the, ve the vast majority of political entities do not survive. And the, uh, the principal cause of the demise is, is war. So uh, it, it's, um, it doesn't, again, it doesn't imply that most wars fought in defense. Uh, uh, all that rational, because they don't survive. You know, if you think of the numbers, over 300 states in Europe in 1100 uh, AD, down to 30 in the 20th century. In Japan, there are 70-something uh, little states in the 15th century. By the 16th century, sorry, by the 17th century, there's only one such single state in Japan. Etc. Etc. So uh, I think that these are kind of good, simple tests, uh, but I obviously have to flesh in the mind. Go to war, and uh, to what extent they are being rational, etc. Etc. Um, let 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 me ask you about that, just uh, as a way of also. Having the opportunity of discuss what um, drives societies, and you argue it's not exactly societies as a whole that go to war, but there's a logic behind that. Um, and it's about, my question is related to the learning process, right? So considering that there's this irrational dimension involved in this decision and the evidence and so um, clear in the very long term, uh, what uh, are these features that inhibit those making the decisions to go to war to be aware that maybe it's a bad idea, that maybe it's not the right tool to reach their ends or so on? Um, how, how do you think about that? Why is it that systematically these leaders are making these wrong decisions involving in wars that it's very likely that they're going to lose. Yes. Well, uh, takes us into uh, the kind of causes, I mean, well, causes which seem apparent to them, to the people who take the decisions, um, and the processes by which uh, wars break out. Um, Historians very often divide wars, the causes of wars, into two. I mean, you don't glory. So greed means that you're, you're trying to make material gains out of this. And glory means that going to war, winning wars, has a a uh, high level of status desirability enabled you to be a major power to be taken seriously uh, to be to have your uh, to have the the history of your realm carefully recorded uh, to be be to the great to be a uh, no, a till of the hun or whatever um though I kind of had a third category, uh, which is 
domination for its own sake. That is the desire to dominate others and kind of rule over them in a pleasure. Um, and there are some other aspects of that, so that for ordinary soldiers, relations is, of course, rape. And rape is where you are demonstrating the superiority of your own civilization to that of the victim. And so uh, there are uh, there are different motives uh, for uh, going to war and classify them in in, in various ways. Uh, you can see that um, the role of ideological power, what uh, in, in general ideological power enables us to do is to fill in the gaps of our certain knowledge of the world with the plausible uh, but untestable set of arguments that religions do, um, fascists do, socialists do, etc., etc., <clears throat> and their ideology. So that ideologies uh, intervene very often. Uh, in European history, you've had a wave of a series of ideological wars, the first one being the wars of religion of the uh, 17th century, and then the next one being the kind of French revolutionary wars, revolutionary nationalism, and uh, third one being the struggle in the 20th century, uh, different ideologies, fascism, socialism, uh, capitalist democracy. Um, and these are um, uh, desirable things in themselves, and imposing your vision of social order on others is a desirable thing to do. And so these are very important, uh, especially in more devastating. <laughs> so we have to add ideology to material gains. Yeah, right. um, furthermore, uh, there are emotions, and emotions are the other way of filling in the gaps in our certain knowledge. Um, if uh, When people go to war, they don't usually do any kind of coldly calculative way they do because they think they have justice on their side and the enemy is it, it's uh, perhaps sometimes evil but just inferior perhaps to us and so these kinds of things substitute for an uh, accurate assessment now if we think about what um a uh, rational decision making to go to war would be th there would be several things involved and um, one would be um <clears throat> the uh, likely cost of war both in terms of the, you know, the material cost and in terms of the likelihood of casualty rate and um, we have the goals to be theoretically uh, obtained uh, or not, uh, and uh, we have the uh, likelihood of success, of victory rather than defeat. Very difficult for anyone to decide what, uh, on balance, would be a, a, um, a, a good enough reason for, go for going to war unless all of these things were favorable. Um, but actually, rulers and their entourages, because these are the people who almost invariably make the decisions, war or peace, um, <laughs> they have one noticeable characteristic, which is that they are rarely risking their own life. They're risking other people's lives. So the loss rate, probably is less salient than one might expect, since these people are not sacrificing themselves. <laughs> but there's also a feature of that. Uh, it's a different form of rationality. 
uh, uh, that is um, that there are some societies which are more militaristic than others and where in going to war uh, society and its rulers are willing to risk war and if necessary pour more resources into war so that uh, very successful conquerors like for example the Romans um, not that they were more rational I mean they usually won but not always in fact very often they lost the first battles but they were willing to dig deeper into the resources of the society in order to fight so that if we contrast the uh, Romans with the the main uh, the main rival for for a century uh, the Carthaginians the Carthaginians were more commercially oriented and were not willing to make to keep on recruiting new legions as the Romans were so um it's that the in this in these cases like this um and I can I can jump for one and uh, is Russia and uh, Putin and uh, willing to make more sacrifices, willing to take a high casualty rate over a long period of time, and that's what the Russian success in modern times has been. Uh, it, it's it's a, kind of a different basis for rationality in the first place, and um, the enemy would see this as it irrational, but Russian leaders do not, and strictly it's just not their own lives. So we have a number of motives uh, getting you know, mixed up together and, 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 and the ideology and uh, emotions which aren't really um, and rationalistic. Um, and we have the additional factors that um, high level of ignorance of the potential enemy. So, uh, it's a kind of negative uh, Durkheim. And Durkheim stressed the normative solidarity of, of societies, right? And I think that's right. <laughs> and it's noticeable in societies um, thinking about going to war that there's a high degree of, of solidarity, a high degree of confidence in the fighting spirit of one's own society. The downside is that um, because society is like a cage, it prevents you from clearly seeing the nature of the, of the other society. So that you consistently have this uh, phenomenon of uh, the two sides marching marching into battle, expecting to be backed by Christmas or when the autumn leaves fall or whatever. And uh, being very willing to believe in the brittle nature of the enemy. And so you have a lot of outcomes where uh, there is unexpectedly stiff resistance, as of course was the case with Ukraine in the last few years. Uh, the Ukraine war is the last war I'm able to win. Then the Israeli torrent conflict hadn't emerged at that level when I when I sent the book to the publisher. I want to ask you more about this recent cases um, in a bit, but before that, I would like us to go through another of the uh, important claims in the book, which is that wars are neither more common, neither less so uh, in recent times, right? Basically, you sort of describe that ever since we sort of discover war, it's been more or less uh, equally frequent. And I want to ask you a bit about the rationale of that or what it's your 
hypothesis of why is that the keys and why all the important changes that have happened ever since the early days of uh, of wars haven't changed this. And I'm thinking about technological change, right? You also talk about how the type of technology used in warfare has profoundly changed. And you talk about two regimes that are structurally different. Why has that not led to making wars more common or not? Uh, but I'm also interested in institutional change, right? Why the expansion of democracies, for instance, and well, the last, leaving aside the backslash that we don't know exactly how large it is or whatever of recent years, we've seen the expansion of democracies in a good part of the world. Why has that not changed the pattern and prevalence of wars? How do you think about that? Well, um, I wouldn't like to be interpreted as saying that uh, the, the frequency of war hasn't shifted because it it has very greatly from from time to time, from place to place. But there is no long term pattern of trajectory. That's what I claim I can detect. Now, this is obviously set against the uh, the argument uh, that in modern democracies uh, make fewer wars uh, than or, uh, more authoritarian uh, uh, regimes. Um, and the democratic peace people have qualified what they're arguing, except that that overall uh, correlation is not there, but that democracies don't fight against other democracies. A, they, they claim that. And so <clears throat> the, the bulk of my argument about whether there's a pattern of war Say that uh, here the political scientists who argue that there's a correlation between democracy and peace, um, that uh, they're deriving this from the Correlates of War project, all of war since 1816. Right. Now, the Correlates of War project uh, analyzes wars in only analyzes wars in which there are 1,000 casualties uh, in any given year. Uh, and there are one or two qualifications of that, which I can't remember what they are off on, off hands. But, uh, uh, but the, the point is that this systematically undercounts a distinctive type of warfare, colonial warfare. And... Um, uh, the great expansion of Europe across the world, the founding of all of those colonies, only very rarely uh, involved large pitched battles in which a thousand people would die. Much more normally, it's a whole series of little campaigns in, in which the local native population uh, never really fights as a single whole, but as the uh, as the European Empire advances, it has new opponents all the time. And if one, of course, it's very difficult to get quantitative data on, on these uh, struggles, but I think I make a, a good case and a long list of uh, of cases which don't make it into the correlates of work, war project. Eventually, a thousand people certainly are killed, more than, far more than that. And um, to uh, pour doubt on the argument. Now, the other thing is that many of these societies are that would have to be called democracies. They're not representative. They're very rarely representative democracies, but they're direct democracies where, for example, all, all the men you know, gather around and decide whether to fight or not. And... There's no coercion on those who decide they don't want to fight. Um, well, very often there isn't. So it is, which applies especially to the United States, of course, where many campaigns against Native Americans um, 
um, but uh, they're not counted. So it's in that respect that in, in modern times, I'd say there isn't either a, a, a decline or a um, or an increase. Now, I, I'm, I rely on other belligerent scientists for some of this uh, because um, you know, other people <laughs> that I didn't invent the notion that uh, civilian casualties have risen and uh, modern warfare and and all, all, all that uh, uh, civil wars have tended to replace interstate wars and and these are things that you know we should add them all in and see what happens. And the answer is there's no discernible secular trend in warfare. It's a perpetual possibility, but one that is uh, only rarely uh, induced. Because one of the other things that I say in this book is that wars are, are not as common as people think. Um, the years in which there's no war in any given society greatly outnumbered in the number you know, in which there is. So one reads little statistics here and there. So um, in the average year in medieval Europe, there's 1.5 uh, wars going on. Gone. Well, this is when there were 300 different states. So it doesn't need there to be much warfare for one to be going on. Um, so you've got to have a, a greater sense of realism of w what it's like on the ground in, in colonial wars and in, in, in a multi-state system wars. Let, let me take the conversation back to today and bring back the well, the situation in Ukraine and also in Israel, Palestine, um, both um, conflicts um, emerge when you were finishing writing the book or after the book. And one of the things that probably I feel that has so surprised most of uh, the people is that even experts is just the fact that they have, well, first occurred, many people thought that they were fairly unlikely even till the last minute when uh, things were clear that were uh, just happening. And the scale of the conflicts uh, have also been probably larger than what, again, this at least this um, community or uh, this uh, group that think that wars are every day less likely uh, seem to traditionally uh, think. So my question here is, um, how do you feel about sort of being right that this uh, things could have happened? And at the very beginning, you mentioned how you were accurate predicting how things would unfold in Afghanistan in some of your previous work, for instance. And I have the impression that you sort of were right on this um, um broad issue of how reasonable this type of conflicts were um, likely to, be play, to take place recently. So that's one, and I think that's a bit of a personal question. How does one feel about the um, accuracy of one's theories uh, on the ground? And then I also want to ask you, how do you think about this Two conflicts. Do you think that they fit well your general interpretation of how wars operate? Uh, and I think you're gonna tell me that they they do. But well, I want to hear how you how you think about this this cases. Yes. Um, well, I think my ability to predict Afghanistan and Iraq uh, it doesn't indicate that I have a general ability to explain. Uh, to predict where, where wars are going to happen and the outcome, which uh, just it struck me that it was obvious that uh, uh, 
that though the U.S. had an enormous preponderance of military power, it didn't have any political power and it didn't have any plans to put a, a serious alternative government in. Um, so its uh, its ideology is perceived in a very different way when perceived by uh, the enemies of the United States. Okay. Um, Ukraine. Well, wars don't very rarely happen as individual phenomena. They, they come in sequences, and there are a to all of Ukraine, um, one is the, uh, the, the disputed uh, the disputed borders, which were already produced in two thousand and four. One um, a Russian incursion and the seizure of the of the Crimea and some of the eastern Donbass as well. Um, uh, and. Uh, I, I divide wars into different types. There are four main types of war, one of which is about disputed borders. And this produces revisionist wars, which have, uh, have a kind of a bite to them because people think they have a right to this territory, which is presently occupied by someone else, uh, but has been taken from us. So uh, the eastern Ukraine and, and the Crimea is an obvious case of uh, disputed uh, terrain in which both sides feel they have a, a legitimate historical interest. Okay. And, it's, um, and indeed, if you look at the history of the Ukraine, it's kind of in and out of the Russian sphere of interest, uh, sometimes in the uh, with independent duchies or whatever itself, sometimes with uh, closer connections to other states than Moscow, but sometimes also a dependency of Moscow. Um, now, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian one is uh, a different order. It is a revisionism, but it's the most... Ex can imagine... That is, that Israel is claiming uh, territories uh, because about 3,000 years ago, God promised them to us. That's on the one. Very long Arab occupation of this land, which is uh, possible to say exactly how long, but it's over a 1,000 years. Uh, and they're both claiming right at the same piece of land. Uh, and that we're, especially in the Israeli case, uh, uh, buttressed by ideological fervor. You know, the, uh, yeah. This is the land of Judea and Samaria. Um, so, uh, and if we go back to the Ukraine, the, uh, the other sequence of wars that matter or Russia are the success in Chechnya, Georgia, Ukraine in 2014. And uh, so there's a degree of success also in Syria. And so one thing you can say is that the more successful previous wars have been, the more likely that well, those uh, the rewards are going to repeat it, and so that was uh, clearly a, a part of uh, Putin's uh, uh, experience. That is, he had been successful in these wars, and so um, answered those questions. Uh, let me let me ask you probably a final question that departs from this um, general issue about and general concern about the present and connects us with the future. And I, I would like to know how you think about the future and the 
and the scenarios where war could escalate and we could uh, get back to a large-scale international conflict. And I would like to add one element to this question, which is the potential role of the international community and the institutionality that exists around the UN, which you seem to be somewhat skeptical about um, its um, capabilities. So um, how do you think about the future? Is there any particular front that you're concerned about? Does it maybe, well, Ukraine or things escalating in the Middle East? Is it something different? Maybe Taiwan? Are you actually concerned about that? Um, are you not? And do you think that in such a scenario where things escalate, do you think that the institutionality that we have could help us to prevent, reduce the impact of this, find a peaceful solution? How do you think about, about that? Well, the most dangerous, dangerous wars, I think, uh, in the sense of the most likely to occur are revisionist wars, and China is um, hurt. <laughs> uh, Taiwan used to belong to China and believes that it should be part of China now, and there's a sincere nationalist belief among what seems to be a, a large majority of Chinese, but certainly among the, the leadership of the, of the Communist Party, uh, that Taiwan is Chinese, and that's not going to go away. And uh, I, now, with a, something as important as a potential war on the horizon between the United States and China, uh, then uh, that's very serious indeed. However, I think I tend to feel that um, the U.S. would ultimately back down um, because it isn't worth a world war. Um, but of course, the future is, of war is especially uncertain because the weapons have developed to the point where they can destroy the planet. So a war, I mean, and... and of course, the record, despite my youth in the campaign for nuclear disarmament, the people who said the nuclear weapons were a deterrent against war were right. It was, they were, and uh, resulted in this Cold War thing of getting clients to do the fighting for you, but making sure that American and Soviet troops never confronted one another. Um, and uh, so that worked. And maybe it's likely to work. Well, so far, India and Pakistan, again, you've got two powers, and they can each see what the consequence of an escalation will be. When you have six or seven nuclear powers uh, in, a, in a region, say the Middle East, um, which we might have before too long, uh, it becomes much more difficult and, and dangerous. There is, however, I think, one um, potentially good thing on the horizon, which is that uh, threat of climate change uh, is, uh, is be gradually becoming accepted by all of, the all of the major states and many of the minor ones as well. accept it but uh, uh, and so there could be uh, a kind of uh, negotiation of common climate and policies and the more inter international collaboration you have uh, the less likely war would be so it could be that the most serious threat of all is the end of the planet through climate change or the end of a climate or planet suitable for human occupation, uh, that from that might come um, a great virtue of univ Kant's universal peace. Uh, so, uh, I, 
However, as I tell my children, I'll be dead by then. So I see. Probably we all would be, but you know, I like this uh, optimistic, slightly uh, tone to to finish our conversation. Um, this was great. I really enjoyed this, um, and I really enjoyed reading the book. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you very much, Michael. No, oh, you're very welcome. I'm very welcome. But if you want to stop wars, read this book. <laughs> thank you for tuning in today to the Economic and Political History Podcast. Don't forget to stay connected with us on YouTube and Spotify. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Javier Mejia C and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me as Javier Mejia Cruvillos. Until next time, stay engaged. Thank you and take care.